So let's talk about, you know, this experience. We've all heard the famous stories from the eighties about how Vince got pretty much everybody that he wanted from the territory system to commit. He'd fly him first class to New York city. And then a limousine would pick him up and take him into the office. They have a personal meeting with Vince. And after he promises him the moon and you're going to make more money than ever, and you're going to be a huge star. We've got your reservations at this five-star restaurant and we've got you these great seats for a Broadway show and enjoy your trip to New York. And boy, we're going to make a lot of money. And he did this certainly for the husbands he was trying to recruit, but he really did it for the wives. He's trying to make sure that, Hey, that we've got a full commitment back home because this traveling schedule is going to be brutal. We need mama bought in. I get it. We haven't heard a lot about the Dixie Carter way of recruiting because well, by and large, a lot of folks who wound up in TNA had gone through the WWE system and were now looking for a second act, or they were hoping that this could possibly get them to the WWE, this TNA opportunity. But this is different. This is the biggest star wrestling ever knew. And now Dixie Carter is trying to land the big fish. And as much as Hulk may have not needed the money, but sure would like to have it. Boy, they needed Hulk Hogan. They probably felt like this is what is going to get us over the hump. And they felt that way because it was Hulk that got Vince over the hump. It was Hulk that got WCW over the hump. It makes sense that maybe he'll do it for us too. Talk to us a little bit about that recruiting process and that experience. You said, you know, the jet's going to come get us. Now we're going to Dixie's house, pick up the story from there. It was very casual. And, and I want to make this really clear because as we go on throughout this episode, however long it's going to take, I'm sure I'm going to say things that some may interpret as me not appreciating Dixie or having affection for her. I do have affection for Dixie. I like Dixie. She's a good human being. She really, really honestly is. A, she's almost too good of a person to be in a wrestling business. And you know what I mean by that. Um, that being said, and this will support it, you know, we got to, Dixie's real. She's not a phony person. She's a very genuine, warm, and pretty open. You know, she's not a game player in that respect. She doesn't, she's just, she was open. She was direct, you know, in terms of describing what she had hoped to achieve with Hulk. She was so unpretentious. Now she's kind of, she, I don't know where she lives now, but she had like a really, really beautiful home. And her husband was there, Serge, and he's a cool, he's cool as shit. I miss him. He was fun to be around. But aside from the, you know, the obvious, you know, money that was in the family in the way and where Dixie lived, she was so unpretentious and down to earth. And I think that's what made it easy for me uh, because I, I enjoyed working with her and talking to her because like, like I said, she wasn't, a, she wasn't playing any games. We, we literally, we got to her house. We sat down in, I don't know what kind of room it was, I guess a sitting area. Very nice, very beautiful home. And Jeff was there. Jeff was driving a lot of the conversations in the very beginning. I think Dixie relied on Jeff because of Jeff's previous relationship with Hulk. Um, Jeff was there. Dixie was there. It was just us, four of us, and kind of talked through the vision that, that Dixie had and, and what she hoped to achieve with Hulk. And, you know, she wanted to achieve some of the same things that I did in WCW. And, uh, she wanted more sponsors. She wanted to be able to increase her licensing portfolio which was pretty much non-existent at the time in any meaningful way. Uh, she wanted to shore up her relationship with the network. Um, there were a lot of things outside of what Hulk was doing, could do in the ring that she was, she wanted Hulk to be kind of the face of the company with regard to, again, potential sponsorship meetings or meetings with the network or, or any of the big trade and industry events. She wanted that Hulk Hogan brand associated with the TNA brand. 
So when you're you're in the room, uh, you, you said that you know Dixie's there, Jeff's there, obviously you and Hulk are there. Is there anybody else there? Do you think? No. No. And are you guys? Do you think it's just Jeff and Dixie sort of painting a picture of what it might look like and what it might feel like? Or are you getting down to the nitty gritty particulars about cash and creative? No, the first meeting was more, I, I always refer to them as temperature checks or chemistry checks. It's just, you know, you don't know for sure how you're going to feel. I don't uh, be specific. I don't know how I'm going to feel about somebody until I've got a couple of hours with them in a room away from a work environment. And that's again, it's my process, you know, pretty good at reading people I generally am I've been wrong but I generally I'm pretty good and it's easier for me to read someone outside of their environment than it is in their environment and we were in Dixie's house that's her environment she was in control we came to them okay so there's that and I was well aware of that but again she was so ch- I don't want to say charming because it's I don't want it to sound like it was fake it was real but she's such a naturally charming person my defense mechanism went down right away because I'll usually walk into meetings like that mentally prepared to, to think through a lot of the things that I'm hearing. Right. I, she disarmed me immediately and it was just a very casual meeting, but we didn't, it was kind of like high altitude. Yeah, but maybe we could do this. Or what about this idea? Or Hawk, would you feel comfortable in this environment? Again, talking about sponsors and networks and things. And then we left. And that's when the deal process started. We didn't talk money. We didn't talk dates. Nothing specific. It was all very general, kind of a macro view of what it could possibly look like, that being Hulk Hogan and TNA together. You know, you're a good uh, judge of character, and you can get a read on people. And, and you sort of alluded to it there, that sometimes your defense mechanism goes up, and it's a feeling out process for you. But right away, you didn't get any concern from Dixie. Like, you didn't think this deal, this deal's going to stink, right? No, no. On the contrary, I felt really good. My read on Dixie was almost immediately a positive one. Like I said, I, I, I dropped my defense mechanism. I wasn't analyzing. I was just listening and reacting as opposed to analyzing what I was hearing. Um, it was, it was just a really good meeting. I, I immediately liked Dixie Jeff. I had known, So there was no unknowns with Jeff. I was, you know, I had a pretty good idea what Jeff was all about. And I liked Jeff and understood him, but Dixie was the unknown, but it didn't, it didn't, that didn't last long. I felt pretty good about it right away. Before you go into a meeting like that, I know that for some people listening to this, they're going to say this sounds silly, but a lot of salespeople uh, have to get in the right headspace mm-hmm. before they're making a presentation because you have to be in that right frame of mind. And if you are, it makes all the difference in the world. Did you have sort of a, a pregame ritual for meetings like this, where you have to have an inner self-talk or do you have certain things, you know, you're going to do on game day, so to speak like this to get ready for a meeting? Yeah, I still do. In fact, I've, I've really spent more time mentally preparing myself for meetings and, or, or, you know, important conversations that are relative to business. I, and and especially because I've got so many things going on inside of my head, even if they're just like little pet projects around the house or something, it's like this movie's constantly running 24 hours a day inside of my head. So sometimes I'll jump from one kind of area. Uh, Jason and I might've been working on a, a documentary, for example, or an idea for a documentary. And I'm negotiating this wrestling deal over here. And sometimes in my head, I just bounce back and forth, you know, and I don't do a very good job uh, on either one of those tasks when I'm bouncing back and forth between them. And there may be three or four things going on sometimes in my head. Um, But when it's important, when I know I need to focus, I mean, I give myself a half hour. The first 10 minutes, five, 10, eight minutes, uh, I pray just to be honest, you know, be transparent about it. I, I talk to God and, and that's part of my process of getting my head right. Because a lot of what I've learned over the years is that I need to focus on my intentions. You know, what do, Mm -hmm. why am I even on this call? How do I want this call to end or to this meeting? What is it I want to walk away? 
away from this meeting knowing, having, or feeling. And I check myself. Is, is, am I doing this for the right reasons? Am I taking this meeting for the right? I check my own intentions, not just the intentions of the people that I may be doing business with. I spend more time thinking about my own. Is this, am I doing this just for the money? Because if I am, I'm out. I'm not doing anything ever again just for the money. I did that with WWE in 2019. I'm not, never going to do it again. Um, so I, I, I do an inventory. And once I get through that process, then I just clear my mind. I literally, I guess it's called meditating. I don't think of it that way. Mm. But I focus on my breathing. I focus on my posture. I focus on clearing my head and, and doing my best not to have a conscious thought. I can't affect my subconscious yet. I'm working on it. But in terms of my conscious thought, the stuff that's going on up here in the frontal lobe, that I try to clear so that when I go into the meeting, I'm hearing things accurately. I'm reading the room properly. I'm not going in with, you know, prejudging a situation or a person or an opportunity, literally going in with kind of a, a blank slate, so to speak. But it takes me about a half hour to get through that process. Now, my process back then was similar but probably not as disciplined or focused as it is now. I've just gotten better at it and probably more than anything, understand how important it is for me just because of the way my fucked up mind works. So yeah, I spent a lot of time doing that. Even in WWE, you know, I don't, I don't know what, I never, nobody ever asked me about it, but before I'd go out in a segment, I would go up to gorilla. I would stand in a corner facing the wall out of the way and I'd go through this pro or a similar process for 15 or 20 minutes before I would go out and do whatever I was doing on camera. Same thing in TNA. So yeah, I, I definitely have a process and it's, it's fun for me because I, I learn more about myself in, in the process of getting ready to do something. 